without further ado, we've made you guys wait a long time. Uh, I'd like to introduce Dave. Uh, he's part of the No Fluff Just Stuff Tour, and uh, he is here to give us a deep dive into, uh, of course, we said my bits and Jeremy, and you know, give us a Grails deep dive. So I will uh, stop talking and get to the good stuff. So, Dave, it's all yours. Thanks for coming. All right. Hello, thanks for having me out. Um, before we get started, I just do want to say another just a brief word about the No Flow Just Stuff Conference since they're set, they sent me out here. I'm not going to be speaking at that one coming up in July, but you've got the, the A team is there. So yeah, if you guys have you been to No Flow Just Stuff Conference before, sort of, how do you like it? It's great stuff. It? Yeah, I was an attendee of these things for about five or six years before I started speaking at them. Um, I actually used to set myself to two of them a year because it was, it was cheaper to go to two no-fluffs per year. There was two of the drive in the uh, Chicago and Milwaukee. But it was cheaper to go to one of the East or West Coast conferences like that, Milwaukee, or SD, or exposed to those things. So it's, it's a great a great value, great content. And like I said, no-fluff. So you don't have the vendor halls, you don't have the vendor keynotes, and you know, all that kind of stuff. Just good technical content. And uh, great, great uh, uh, access to speakers, too, because it's limited, limited attendance. So I encourage you to check that out, and let's get started. So we're talking about Rails here today. Anybody familiar with Rails already here? You, okay, that's good. So we're, we're not doing the basic getting to you know, start a demo. I'm going to actually start with an app that I've created already. I'll show you what I did to get there, but I didn't want to take too much time to go over the, the real basics, so I want to go a little deeper on this talk. So let's get started with that. First of all, a few more brief, brief words. I do write a, a column for Groovy Mag, and the publisher asked me to mention it. Uh, Groovy Mag is an a e magazine that's all it's related to um, all Groovy technology. So, Groovy, Rails, Griffin, Gradle, there's a whole lot of other tools coming out of the Groovy community, and it, this covers them all pretty well. So, check that out. Also, the No Fluff Just Stuff magazine, put out by the same people that put on the conference. Most of the articles are by speakers, so it's, it's a really good uh, magazine as well to stay up with uh, the Java world. And then one last thing is the book I wrote. It's Grails a Quick Start Guide. If you're interested in learning more about Grails and you don't want to invest the time in one of the bigger books that are out there, there's some excellent books out there. But this one's uh, a smaller book that can get you up and running quickly. And from what I've heard from people, it's done pretty good at that. And also, um, just to let you know that my share of the proceeds for the sale of this book all go to feed hungry children. My children. <laughs> they do get hungry. <laughs> Alright, so that's it for the sales. <clears throat> now, what we're going to do today is we're going to build an application called Juggler. It's a, a, a Java user group management system. I'm completely sold on Java user groups, so I love coming to these. Um, I led a group in Madison, Wisconsin for about three years, and now, now I lead a, a group user group in St. Louis because there's already two Java user groups in St. Louis, so we didn't need a third one. Um, but anyway, so that's what the example app we're going to use. And here's our domain model for it. So we have these four classes we're going to have uh, members. Uh, interest is just a single screen field there, just to keep a uh, table to keep track of the various topics our members are interested in. We're going to keep track of our speakers and then our meetings. All right, and that's about it we're going to have for the slides. Now we're going to jump over and start doing some coding. Now, most of the coding will be through some text based snippets that I say, so you don't have to type too much. So earlier I created an application, and I'm just going to show you what I did to create it. Is it all visible up here? Is it going to be bigger? Right. So all you do to create an application in Rails is do Rails create dash app, and then give a name. So that single command there, I already ran it, so I'm not going to run it again now, but that command there will give us a complete project ready to go. Okay. So now you see here in the project drawer, I've got this juggler directory was created by that command. In there, there's several other directories. The main one we're working is Rails app that has all of our, our artifacts, all the things we need for a, a, a web application. Now, Rails wraps Spring and VC. So if you use Spring MVC for web applications already, then a lot of us will be familiar. You'll see the, the tie-ins as we go. 
So we have controllers, which are going to handle the incoming requests and pass off to, to different views. We have our views down here. We have a folder for our domain classes, one for services, one for tag lives, and then a couple other utility type things. This, we also have this uh, live folder, or live folder, where we put any, any jars we want to include in our project. We put them in there. Later on, you can build a war, and those will be bundled in with you ready to go. And then a place for our tests, and then the web app contains things like CSS, JavaScript, all that kind of stuff. It's web. But everything has a place, and everything goes in its place. Rails is very strongly based on convention. So by putting things in a certain directory and giving them a certain name, they will get certain behaviors automatically, and you will have to code them, and we'll see that in a bit. The next thing I did is I created some domain classes. And I used a Grail script for that, which you don't have to do because they're just plain classes we'll see in a minute. But Grails create dash domain dash class and then give it a name, like I did the number, for example. And that'll create a stubbed out domain class for us. I just want to show you that it's not really even necessary to run that because it's just a plain Ruby source file. It's kind of like a Java file without the semicolons. Anybody here familiar with Ruby already? Okay, so, all right, that's good. So, if you're not familiar with Ruby, some of these things might look a little bit strange to you, but they shouldn't be too, too different because the, the Ruby syntax is not very different than, than Java syntax. So, in our domain class folder here, we have a, a package folder called Juggler. Now, that's the default behavior in Rails. If you don't give a package for any of your artifacts you create, and you run those scripts to do the generation for you, it will create a package by default named after your application. So, I'm just let you do that you now. And I created these four domain classes. So we'll take a look at the first one here at number. When I stub it out with that script, it just gives you the class name and the, the package, the class name, and then this little block for constraints we're talking about. There. There's nothing in it at first. So the rest of this is added. So I've added a few properties. Now these look like just uh, public fields, but they're not. They're, they're called Ruby properties. What they are is a, that each one of these is a combination of a, of a private field and public getters and setters that you don't have to code. But they're, just, they're created by the compiler at runtime for compiler. So we have three string properties here first name, last name, and email. And I have this has many. Now, has many is something that Rails provides to set up uh, one to many relationships, or many to many relationships, for that matter. So, all we're saying is that this, app, this class has many um, interest classes. So, it's going to create a, a collection for us of interest objects called interests. And so the first value here is the, is the property name for the collection, and the second one is the type it's going to hold. Then coming down here, we have this constraints block. Now constraints do two, th two three things, three main things in a Grails application. The first one is uh, validation, data validation. So we can set things like nullable uh, or blank, be true or false. Um, this email constraint is a custom constraint that comes with Rails and that just checks the data, the, the value to check to see if it is a valid email structure. And then um, that's the only reason here. There's other people see us in the other classes in it. And I gave it a, a two string. This two string, the only different about it is I'm using a Groovy string here. Groovy strings allow you to, to put uh, variables or code snippets inside the string and they're evaluated at, at runtime. So I just put it, you preface it with a dollar sign for just a single, simple variable, or if it's an expression of uh, a snippet of Groovy code, you would do dollar sign and then embrace this. So you can do it with or without braces for a simple value, but if you want the more complex, you have to have the braces in there. So that's a Groovy string and returning. Now there's also, you notice there's no return statement here. I can put one in. But returns are optional in, in Ruby. The last statement evaluated is always returned by default. All right, so then coming back to the constraints. The constraints, this is a DSL. So what we're basically really doing is calling method names. You're, you're calling a, a method named after your, your properties, and those methods don't exist. So at runtime, that's caught, and, and it's handled based on the fact that we can transblock and handle it a specific way. So um, you can see it looks a lot like just a, a method call. All right, so let's look at one of the other classes. Um, the interest class is real simple. It's a string name, but it also has a static property called belongs to. This goes along with it has many of the Excel members. And this is the other side of a, of a one of many bidirectional relationship. And by having both those pieces in place, we have automatic cascading built in for us. So if we create a member, add a bunch of interest to it, and save the member, it'll save all the interest objects. If 
familiar number of them do that is not just the category. And if we didn't put any faith on this one, we don't need to. So there's another one now, speaker. Our speaker just has a for strength properties. It has an extra a different constraint that we've used before. This one uses a max size constraint. And this brings out another one of the things that constraints are used for. Constraints are also used to give hints to the, the, the schema generator. And Grails will create a database schema for us, for all those, these four classes that we're creating. We'll create four tables. And the max size tells it some information about what type of column to create. Right? By default, string uh, property will result in a column that's a bar char 255. This one will end up as probably, in my SQL, will end up as a text field, a text column. So it might be something else um, than it is. So that's the second thing that constraints are used for. Another thing that constraints are used for is to determine uh, give hints to the view generation. So for example, uh, string fields on the views that are going to create, which we'll see in a minute, the um, string fields are just an input to the HTML input field. When you put a max size that's bigger than 250 characters, it'll turn into a text area instead. So, so that's the three main purposes of constraints of the data validation, which are happy to happen when uh, we save the data. Um, Schema generation, hints, and view generation. Our last class we'll look at is the meeting. Okay, so we have this meeting. The class has three fields, three properties, date, string, and it's got a speaker. So this is just a single reference to the speaker object that we were hired here. Another thing on the view generation that the, that the constraints do, um, they determine the, the order on the pages, as we'll see in a little bit. So it's going to create list views for us and uh, uh, single page, single object show views and edit view and create view. And all those views, the fields are lined up either alphabetically by default or the order that you have them in the constraints. So here I didn't have any specific constraints to put on, I just put them in there to keep them sorted right. And in this case, I didn't need to do that even because they're already alphabetical, so we want to let that just happen that way. But if you didn't want that, you know, the, the, there's a purpose for having them in there to keep the order of the page. All right, so that's, I created this for the classes. So, so far, I've just got a you know, minimal amount of code I've had to write. Then the next thing I did, I'm pretty sure I did it. Let me double check. We didn't have any minute. So I did, okay, we're doing this next step in a minute. But one thing I want to show is that on this member class, I already have a table I want to look up to, a database. I have a MySQL database already out here called Jug Data. It has a single table that I call Members. Now this table has a primary key called Member Num. It's got a first underscore name, last underscore name, email underscore address. Okay, so this is what I already have. This is like our legacy data. I just want to show how we can, how Rails handles existing databases because. The, the ideal, the sweet spot for Rails is, is Greenfield. If you have a new application, it will do everything for you. Um, that often isn't the case. So if you have an existing data you have to hook up to, we're going to show how to do that. So this is the existing database we have. So go back to our number. We're going to add a block of code here 